After discussing the concepts of difference and repetition in depth in the last two chapters, Deleuze now prepares the way to apply them concretely. As a first step in this process, he denounces the classical image of thought. This is the core of his critique of representation. At the heart of this critique is the following observation. Every time we think, there is a certain number of assumptions that we make about thought, and the critique of representation, in order to be effective, must identify and reject these premises. In chapter 3, which we are now going to examine, Deleuze identifies eight such premises. One way to understand the logic that binds them is through the following questions. Where does thought begin? Who is the thinker? How does one think? Why do we make errors? When do we actually think? And what is knowledge? The list does not ask these questions directly, but they are a helpful tool to understand what's going on in this chapter. So let's begin with the first question. Where thought begins is an important problem in any field of knowledge because it addresses the question of what do we give ourselves? For example, if I am a materialist, I give myself the material world, which means the concept of matter that is then used to explain everything except, of course, itself. If I am an idealist, I give myself the thinking subject as a measure of all reality, but I cannot explain this subject. The given is that which cannot be explained. It's the set of axioms that precedes and supports a reflection. In philosophy, the question of what we give ourselves is equally important because it predetermines the questions we can ask and the answers we can bring. What philosophers usually give themselves, Deleuze explains, is the natural faculty to think, which implies the goodwill of the thinker and the good nature of thought. Both of these are central to representation, and they become visible when people say things like this. Everybody knows, no one can deny, is the form of representation and the discourse of the representative. For example, when Descartes says, I think, therefore I am, he really says, everybody knows that doubt is a form of thought. Nobody can deny that if I doubt, I exist. So in other words, Thinkers assign the starting point of thought in common sense, and the argument is that because everybody thinks naturally, then everybody must know, at least implicitly, what it means to think. So Deleuze says, The implicit presupposition of philosophy may be found in the idea of a common sense as cogitatio natura universalis. On this basis, philosophy is able to begin. Of course, Deleuze disagrees with this view, which is the purest expression of Platonism. Rather, he says, the act of thought does not begin in the goodwill of the thinker, or in common sense. He makes this surprising remark. Thought is primarily trespass and violence, the enemy, and nothing presupposes philosophy. Everything begins with misosophy. This is to say that we are forced to think, and what forces us to think is what Deleuze calls the object of encounter. It is the object of perception that is forced upon us, and which then forces a specific problem onto us. As Deleuze says, the object of encounter really gives rise to sensibility with regard to a given sense. It is not the given, but that by which the given is given. This is a way of saying that the object of thought is not what exists out there. There is no given object waiting for us to be discovered, nor is there a hidden identity within us. Rather, what is given is difference itself, a differential perception that can only be felt. So Deleuze says this, what is encountered may be Socrates, a temple, or a demon. It may be grasped in a range of effective tones, wonder, love, hatred, suffering, in whichever tone, its primary characteristic is that it can only be sensed. In this sense, it is opposed to recognition. So, the point is that we think not because we want to, but because we have to. This changes quite radically the figure of the thinker and of the philosopher. And it brings us to the second point. Who is the thinker? In Platonism, the thinker himself is said to be of good will, naturally attracted to the truth. But as Nietzsche argues, this view betrays a profound morality hidden behind the desire for knowledge. When Nietzsche questions the most general presuppositions of philosophy, he says that these are essentially moral, since morality alone is capable of persuading us that thought has a good nature and the thinker a good will, and that only the good can ground the supposed affinity between thought and the true. So in the classical image of thought, the thinker is the person of good sense, an eminently moral subject who believes that the correspondence between knowledge and nature, or between words and ideas, is rooted in the good. But being forced to think means to think without any presupposition, without any given, without anything given in advance, especially not the good. The misosophist is not primarily interested in the truth. He is not an individual who presupposes the truth. As Deleuze says, not an individual endowed with good will and a natural capacity for thought, but an individual full of ill will who does not manage to think, either naturally or conceptually. 
Only such an individual is without presuppositions. Only such an individual effectively begins and effectively repeats. Such a one is the untimely, neither temporal nor eternal. In this new sense, the thinker is really between worlds, neither empirical nor spiritual. He is like an animal, harassed by thoughts, forced to jump between the realm of the eternal and the temporal, like a fox tormented by the hunter's snares. We are far, far away from the figure of the noble thinker who apprehends the truth under the auspices of goodness and goodwill. But precisely, what does it mean to be forced to think? or to think without presuppositions. This is the third point. Classically, in Platonism, the relation between the perceived object and the natural faculties is one of identity, that is to say, they correspond because there is an implicit unity of being which creates both, or which maintains both into being. As Deleuze says, no doubt each faculty, perception, memory, imagination, understanding, has its own particular given, and its own style, its peculiar way of acting upon the given. An object is recognized, however, when one faculty locates it as identical to that of another, or rather when all the faculties together relate their given and relate themselves to a form of identity in the object. For the philosopher, the form of identity in objects relies upon a ground in the unity of a thinking subject, of which all the other faculties must be modalities. So for Plato, the faculties can perceive truthfully because they congregate around the identity of the object, which is perceived through the unity of being. Of course, Deleuze opposes this directly, which makes for one of the most exciting moments in difference and repetition, because Deleuze outlines the conditions for a new understanding or doctrine of the faculties. This is to say that the problem of knowledge is not about the relation between the empirical and the transcendental, that is, about the correspondence between reality and the faculties. Rather, it's about the relation between the faculties. This doctrine works as follows. There is no philia which testifies to a desire, love, good nature or good will, by virtue of which the faculties already possess or tend towards the object to which they are raised by violence, and by virtue of which they would enjoy an analogy with it or a homology among themselves. Each faculty, including thought, has only involuntary adventures. Involuntary operation remains embedded in the empirical. So the faculties, in Deleuze's sense, follow each other, not because they have a common object, but because they sort of shock each other into being. The harmony between the faculties can appear only in the form of a discordant harmony, since each communicates to the other only the violence which confronts it with its own difference and its divergence from the others. Deleuze goes on to explain that what passes from one faculty to the next is difference, also called the idea with a capital I. Ideas are instances which go from sensibility to thought and from thought to sensibility, capable of engendering, in each case, according to their own order, the limit or transcendent object of each faculty. Concretely speaking, this means that sensation goes beyond itself by producing a limit which it then transcends, creating a transcendent object called the sentiendum. The sentiendum is that which can only be felt, meaning that it cannot be imagined or remembered or thought other than abstractly. The sentiendum gives way to the next faculty, namely imagination, whose transcendent object is the phantastion, that which can only be imagined. In turn, this gives way to memory and its own transcendent object, called the memorandum, that which can only be remembered. Finally, thought, whose transcendent object is the cogitandum, that which can only be thought. All of these together form the idea of a thing. This grounds the famous method called transcendental empiricism, which then focuses on the passage between each faculty. But perhaps you can already feel how much this opposes the Platonic model, in which the faculties working together do not produce a transcendent object, but work on the basis of recognition. They converge as equals around the given object. In Platonism, Deleuze explains, there is indeed a model, in effect, that of recognition. Recognition may be defined by the harmonious exercise of all the faculties upon a supposed same object. The same object may be seen, touched, remembered, imagined or conceived. This means that in Platonism I can know what I know by virtue of the fundamental but invisible unity between thought and reality, which allows me to recognize eternal forms, the essences, which are, by way of consequence, the objects of knowledge. This means that the act of knowledge is the act by which I conform my temporal knowledge to eternity, and indeed for Plato, knowledge is primarily recognition as the act by which I adjust my temporal knowledge to eternal truth. Deleuze, of course, argues for a completely different understanding. As we have seen, he explains that knowledge begins in encounter, not recognition. This is why he mocks the attempts to ground knowledge in recognition and condemns them as masked attempts to derive personal benefits. 
How derisory are the voluntary struggles for recognition? Struggles occur only on the basis of a common sense and established values for the attainment of current values, honors, wealth, and power. The object of encounter is not really an object, but its difference itself. The problem with the model of recognition is that it subordinates, or as Deleuze says, crucifies difference, and it does so in four distinct ways. The singular nature of the encounter is subordinated to identity in the concept, which constitutes the form of sameness in recognition. The positive nature of the concept is subordinated to opposition in the determination of the concept, that is, to the comparison between predicates and their opposite. This is what happens when I define the concept of dog negatively, as not cat or not turtle, for example, instead of positively, as this particular dog. The being of the encounter or difference is subordinated to the analogy in judgment, where being is simply expressed in terms of general categories. That's what we have seen a while ago about Aristotle, with the categories being can only be said analogically. Finally, the encounter is reduced to resemblance in the object. This is when I use difference as a simple principle of comparison to reduce an object to its resemblance to another object. In representation, the singularity of an object is missed, its particular difference is subordinated to the elements of identity, sameness, analogy, and opposition. As Deleuze says with emphasis, they form quadripartite fetters under which only that which is identical, similar, analogous, or opposed can be considered different. Difference becomes an object of representation always in relation to a conceived identity, a judged analogy, an imagined opposition, or a perceived similitude. In other words, Platonism remains incapable of grasping difference itself. So, how can we think difference, according to Deleuze? By definition, we cannot think the unthinkable, so we find ourselves in the same situation as the great ancient and medieval thinkers who realized that we cannot have direct knowledge of God in the same way that we can know about existing things. But if we cannot know what God is, at least we can know what he is not, which is already something. If we cannot study thought or difference directly, then perhaps we can study it negatively, that is, through its misadventures. As Deleuze says, it is noteworthy that the dogmatic image, for its part, recognizing only error as a possible misadventure of thought, and reduces everything to the form of error. This indeed is the fifth postulate that we should take into account taking error to be the sole negative of thought. This leads us to the next question. Why do we make errors? What can errors teach us about the real nature of thought? Here is what Deleuze says. Who says good morning Theodorus when Theaetetus passes? It is 3 o'clock when it is 3.30, and that 7 plus 5 equals 13. Answer the myopic, the distracted, and the young child at school. These are effective examples of errors but examples which, like the majority of such facts, refer to thoroughly artificial or puerile situations and offer a grotesque image of thought because they relate it to very simple questions to which one can and must respond by independent propositions. This is to say that errors in the Platonic model of recognition are simply understood as faulty designations, but this means that the misadventures of thought come from without, from a misperception or a mistake in one or the other of the faculties. This means that the worst misadventure of thought in Platonism tells us very, very little about the nature of knowledge and of thought. What about real errors, Deleuze asks? Errors that occur not so much to the mind as when we designate something external, but errors that occur in the mind in the form of illusions. This is a theme that Deleuze inherits from Hume and empiricism. It's something that he is sort of painfully aware of, as it were. So in another text from the same period as Difference and Repetition, Deleuze says this. Hume is effecting a second major displacement in philosophy. For the traditional concept of error, he substitutes the concept of illusion, or delirium, according to which there are not false but illegitimate beliefs, illegitimate operations of the faculties, and illegitimate functionings of relations. Illusions are due to an inability to formulate a problem adequately, that is, to a mishap not in recognition, as for Plato, but in individuation. Illusions happen when thought takes the self as the object, which leads to the fractured self, as we have seen many times. A practical example of such an illusion would be found in egomania, for example. In technical terms, this is to say that illusions happen when the act of grounding effectuated in the transcendental operation places the individual at the center of the picture, as the cause of itself and of what it knows. But behind this illusion, a terrible danger lurks, 
Individuation as such, as it operates beneath all forms, is inseparable from a pure ground that it brings to the surface and trails with it. It is difficult to describe this ground, or the terror and attraction it excites. Turning over the ground is the most dangerous occupation, but also the most tempting in the stupefied moments of an obtuse will. For this ground, along with the individual, rises to the surface yet assumes neither form nor figure. It is there, staring at us, but without eyes. The individual distinguishes itself from it, but it does not distinguish itself, continuing rather to cohabit with that which divorces itself from it. So how do we escape this illusion? This is the object of our next question. When do we really become able to think? Thought does not begin when we take ourselves as conditions. Of course, thought has to do with sense much more than the self and sense is fundamentally about the movement of thought. As Deleuze explains, for Plato this movement would go from a hypothetical proposition to a necessary or absolute one, that is, one that is either true or false. So for Plato, sense is the movement by which a hypothetic proposition acquires a truth value such that knowledge becomes absolute, which in philosophy is called apodictic knowledge. An example of the movement from the hypothetic to the apodictic could be the following. I make a proposition like the sky is blue, which at first is hypothetic, and if, after verification, the proposition is true, then it is absolutely true. If it's false, then it's absolutely false. In both cases, the proposition has become apodictic. But the apodictic nature of knowledge is not identical to its sense. In fact, if you equate sense to the proposition which expresses it, you're going to fall in an infinite regress. As Deleuze says in Logic of Sense, where this theme is developed in depth, Given a proposition which denotes a state of affairs, one may always take its sense as that which another proposition denotes. If the sense of a proposition was identical to its expression, this would give way to a paradox, an infinite regress, which in difference and repetition Deleuze calls redoubling. So, for example, I can say that I think, which, if the sense and expression of the proposition are identical, means that I think that I think, which means in turn that I think that I think that I think, etc. The only way to escape this first paradox of sense is to use another paradox, which Deleuze calls the paradox of doubling. Doubling, he says, means that sense is no longer in a precipitation, but in a suspension. This second paradox states that to avoid redoubling, I need to fixate the proposition long enough to extract its meaning. The problem is that in doing so, I obtain a neutral proposition in which meaning is ambiguous. So, for example, I can transform the proposition the sky is blue into an infinitive, a participial, or an interrogative clause. To blue, the being blue of the sky, or is the sky blue, all of which have the same sense, but are different expressions. But this only doubles the proposition with another proposition, which is like the smile of the Cheshire cat, just a ghost, and a sterile one which can produce nothing. The double of the proposition is sterile because there, sense is indifferent to the significations it can take. The being blue of the sky can signify that the sky is or is not blue, that it is both universally blue and blue in this specific place only, that it is possibly blue and really blue, etc. etc. In this second paradox, sense may have become independent from its original proposition, as was needed, but only to become sterile, ambiguous, and unable to produce anything. What we need is a movement that will allow us to produce sense. How can we do this? Let's understand the elements that are at stake here. While formal logic articulates the truth or falsity of a proposition, transcendental logic states the conditions of its apparition. So formal logic tells us if the sky is or is not blue, while transcendental logic tells us why we need to make this determination in the first place. Both aspects are needed to determine the sense of a proposition, but they are incompatible with each other. So the movement we seek is found in the passage from one to the other, and the question now becomes, how do we effectuate the passage from the logical form to the transcendental form? Fortunately, we already know the answer from the previous chapter. It is grounded in the difference between Kant and Descartes in their evaluation of the cogito. To put things very schematically, Descartes' version of the cogito goes like this. Something indeterminate, I am, is determined by a determination, I think, such that the knowledge that I have of my own existence is instantaneous. It happens in no time. But Kant's objection to Descartes is that something is missing here, a third value, which as Deleuze says is the determinable, or rather the form in which the undetermined is determinable by the determination. This third value suffices to make logic a transcendental instance, 
It amounts to the discovery of difference, no longer in the form of an empirical difference between two determinations, but in the form of a transcendental difference between the determination as such and what it determines, no longer in the form of an external difference which separates, but in the form of an internal difference which establishes an a priori relation between thought and being. The determinable, the third element, is exactly what's required to explain the back and forth between thought and being, or between words and ideas. It introduces time in philosophy, and this is a big deal because if thought takes time, then problems must be constructed, ideas, truths and essences must be constructed as well. This allows us to address the last question, what is knowledge? We know that it is not just about truth and falsity, nor simply about the conditions of apparition. But how does movement or passage translate into knowledge? Knowledge is not a state, but it's a process which Deleuze calls learning. It is not the product of a method, but it is a form of culture. Learning is not the process of integrating facts in the form of propositions. For example, Louis XIV was born in the year 1638. It is rather a process of becoming. And here Deleuze is very concrete. For example, he says, To learn to swim is to conjugate the distinctive points of our bodies with the singular points of the objective idea in order to form a problematic field. Learning is the manner in which thought becomes a temporal process. Learning is the true transcendental structure which unites difference to difference, dissimilarity to dissimilarity, without mediating between them and introduces time into thought. Similarly, culture is not or should not be a movement of normalization grounded in identity. Such is the origin of a grotesque image of culture that we find in examinations and government referenda as well as in newspaper competitions, where everyone is called upon to choose according to his or her taste on condition that this taste coincides with that of everyone else. Here, Deleuze marks the formula that all fake cultures share, namely, be yourselves, it being understood that this self must be that of others. Culture is not a movement of normalization or conformity, it is not a template meant to be imitated. Culture is an involuntary adventure, the movement of learning which links a sensibility, a memory and then a thought, with all the cruelties and violence necessary, as Nietzsche said, precisely in order to train a nation of thinkers, or to provide a training for the mind. And so, the old image of thought is replaced as follows in our chart, which is also the summary of what we have seen so far. Thought begins not in identity, but in difference. The thinker does not have a natural affinity for the truth, on the contrary, he is forced to think because problems force us to think. Thought does not recognize eternal ideas, but rather it is subject to encounters. To the subordination of difference to identity, we must begin with difference as that by which the given is given. To error as a product of a faulty exercise of the senses, or as an extrinsic phenomenon, we must oppose the imminent illusions of the mind. To the paradoxes of sense, we must oppose nonsense the ground with no eyes, as the instance which generates sense. To the idea that problems can be mirrored in propositions, we must oppose the notion that problems must be constructed. And finally, to knowledge and method, we must oppose learning and culture. So knowledge is not a state, but a process of learning, which includes things as diverse as learning Latin, learning to love, or learning to swim. This is how the image of thought becomes, as Deleuze says, a thought without image, which will allow us to understand how sense can become productive. So it's a creation of difference itself, which is the subject of the next chapter. Finally, I just wanted to mention that I have pages on Patreon and Coffee now, where you can support my work with a tip or a monthly donation. Your support means that I can create more content about Deleuze's thought, and as an independent creator, it's a real tap on the shoulder, and it means a lot. For now, thank you very much for watching, and see you soon.